rather than ask end of season questions, we, we do this today and sort of hold up my end of the bargain. I also want to give you everybody that didn't uh, didn't go to Fort Worth an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, kind of had a week now to reflect and, and think back on the 2019 season. Um, five and seven record, uh, not good enough. You know, it's not going to not not doesn't meet the standard here. I'm well aware of that. Um, however, I thought you know we were on favor in what two out of twelve games. I was pleased with how we finished the season. I thought we played the best football in November over the last three weeks of the season. Um, excited about our future. Excited about where we're going. Um, played a ton of first and second year players. We're returning a high, really high percentage of production on offense and defense. We got some holes to fill on special teams, but a high, high level of production in offense and defense. Huge, huge offseason for us. I think both in the recruiting aspect and development. Um, really kind of our focus on what I, what I sent as I traveled to our team last Monday was we got to be focused on being one of the most improved teams in the country next year. Um, I think the key areas of improvement for us offensively is run game production. You know, if we want to make strides um, offensively and make strides as football team, we've got to be able to run the ball better. And then defensively, we've got to increase our takeaways. You know, those are the two biggest uh, statistical pieces that we've got to make uh, strides in. Um, busy time of the year in recruiting. Um, last week was contact, um, traveling around, hitting guys that are committed or we're trying to get um, in the boat. Got contact period goes through really next Saturday. Uh, official visit this weekend, next weekend. Got two big junior days this month. Um, plan on finishing strong you know, with the intention of signing most of our class uh, on December 18th. Um, we'll talk more about them. We'll talk about recruiting on December 18th. We'll have a press conference that day as well. So with that, I'll open up to questions. Neil, you addressed some of the underclassmen that aren't going to be here. Are there any that you know of now besides those we've already talked about? That aren't going to be here? Yeah, aren't So I think Giovanni went into the portal today. I think he and I are going to meet later today. I haven't had a chance. I just got back uh, late last night, so I haven't had a chance to sit down with him. Um, but he's in the portal. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk to him. Adam Stilley is in the portal um, in support of him. He, he wants to go play, and, and he's done nothing but – he's been nothing but great here. Worked hard, uh, so I support him in, in that endeavor. Um, nothing but positive for him. So I think that's – for right now, I think that's, that's it. As a coach, how difficult does it get a feel for how active transfers may be? Yeah, you know, you just try to – I think that what you try to do is just build a relationship. Social media, it's, it's not a West Virginia issue. It's not even a Division One football issue. It's just, it's kind of the world we live in. You know, it's, there's so much, and everybody's circumstances are different. You know, like just talked about still, his circumstances are quite a bit different than some other guys. You know, so um, I think it's part of it. The, the hardest part is managing your roster. I think we talked about that at the start of the year. It's just, it's just difficult to manage your roster. Um, but I think one way that you, the best way you can do about preventing those is just build relationships. Now, the playing time piece is, is what it is. You know, if somebody's not happy with the playing time, then that's been the case for a long time. You know, I mean, as far as people leaving because of playing time, that's it. But as far as people just getting upset and things, I think you got to invest time in relationships. Have you talked to your colleagues about the potential imbalances, the way the system's set up right now? I mean, there could be conceivably more kids in the portal than there are spots for people to go. Yeah, so I think that'll be a point of discussion when we meet its head coaches in the, at the AFCA, whatever, January 14th, whatever it is. Um, and I think they're – and that's probably more of a question for Shane because Shane's on the oversight committee. And I think for the first year or so of the portal, the data wasn't great because you couldn't tell who were scholarship players in the portal who were walk-ons. I think they've clarified some of that. So I think you'll start getting some – and again, this is a question for him. But my understanding of it, you'll start getting some clear data um, on how many put themselves in the portal, how many get out. Um, because what people don't think about, whether it's the student athletes, their parents, or whoever's kind of assisting them in their decision making, is if you take somebody out of the portal, that counts on your 25. You know, so so every transfer you take, that's a high school or junior college product uh, prospect that you couldn't take. 
And I don't think that always factors in because, you know, you would love to take a kid maybe that you think can be a short-term solution for your program, but if they don't fit in that 25, you're kind of making a decision. Is it a short-term or long-term decision? And so those are, those are sometimes difficult. And your situation is <coughs> different than a lot of people. Whether you're rebuilding your program mm -hmm. or not, the numbers just start matching. Yeah. It's almost, um, this one one reason why we're putting a, a huge emphasis on kind of rebuilding our walk-on program and with the point that we have to do a better job of developing our walk-ons. Because really the only way you can, in this day and age, to get to your 85 under the current rules is by putting uh, walk-ons who earn that opportunity on scholarship. That's the only reason, that's the only really way you can, can get to your 85. So I think there's the recruiting piece and the development piece. So the development piece is critical. I think that we've got to get stronger, especially on the interior part of the offensive line. And some of that's through youth and just time will solve that. I think that um, some of it's technique. Um, you know, there's a strength component, there's a pad level component, there's an explosive, explosive component to it. We've got to get better at that. That's why, um, the offseason is so critical. Okay, um, we got to do a better job of finishing runs at running back. We got to do a better job in space at running back. You can address some of that. Okay, during the offseason, you can get a little bit of that. Um, and then some of it's recruiting. You know, or we got to develop. Uh, we've got to recruit guys that are, that can compete for playing time. I think that y'all heard me say this a bunch. The more competition you have in the room, the more push there is to get everybody in that room better. And so we've got to get some more bodies in that room. Um, we've got to get some bigger, more explosive guys in that room. Um, we've got to get some more depth at running back. I think those are, it's, it's you know, we got to, as coaches, we've got to look, all right, schematically, you know, what, what can we do better? You know, you know, from winter installation, spring installation, how we go about practicing. I mean, when, when you're as poor at that area as we were, everything's on the table. <laughs> you know what I mean? Schematics, the whole deal. I mean, that's that is the number one, and, and there's a clear gap between that and anything else. We got to get better at offensively. You, when you did that at Troy, you had that jump from your first year to your second year. What was it specifically that you were able to improve in the first year? The, the same, the same two things: recruiting and development. Let me tell you something. The offensive line is the hardest position to recruit. First of all, you're there's just not very many big human beings. <laughs> you know what I mean? So size, the size component, all right? And then you're looking for guys, like when you recruit offensive linemen, you're looking for either guys that are guys that got to add weight, you know, and that are projects a little bit, or you're trying to recruit guys that that are the <coughs> size already. You just got to get them stronger, get them experienced. And so, you know, there's a small number of those, and it's, it's really, really competitive from a recruiting standpoint. Uh, so going back at Troy, what we did, I mean, so the recruiting piece of it was big, you know. Um, we significantly changed our starting lineup. Um, you know, I think maybe we returned, I'm going off the top of my head here, guys. So I think we either returned either two, maybe three that the most were, were starters coming back. Um, we added some older guys that, that helped us immediately, and we felt like the way we, you know, I think, Last year, our fourth year, I think four out of five made all conference, and um, all those were kids that we that we recruited out of high school and developed, um, which is probably the best way to do it. It just takes some time, um, and then we went back and were really really simple um, early on, like you know what I mean, in winter, in spring, into the summer. We didn't get we didn't have a wide variety of run schematics. Um, and we weren't great. No, we had we had two really good running backs too now. We had a kid that's still with the till still with the Cowboys. And we had another kid that's about two hundred and fifty five pounds that just did kind of wore people out. And the guy with the Cowboys about two thirty five. Um, and so those are some of the things we did. I think every situation was different though. How much going through Troy helped you through this year and, and will help you through this winter? Yeah, well I think they're they're all, every situation is different. Um, 
And I think that each kind of, and maybe it's probably like this for you in journalism too, I don't know, but like you learn a little bit on every stop of the way. Um, so, for example, like we had all first year receivers at Kentucky my first year at Cordae. And we did a much better job developing those guys this year than we did then just because we went through the process before. All right? Um, and that's one of my, one thing that I'm really pleased with Xavier Dye. I'm really pleased with our young receivers. I thought they really improved as the year went on. Um, and that's just an example. You know, we learned from that time at Kentucky. We applied it to a situation that was very similar. We had all first year, um, mostly first year receivers. And I thought we did a better job. I did, I did a better job from an offensive coordinator standpoint, from a head coach standpoint, uh, really giving Xavier the tools and, and kind of helping him uh, develop those guys. Um, as far as just, you know, the, the one similarity is we finished strong at Troy that first year, and we finished strong this year, okay? That is probably the biggest piece of it. Now, we had a, a tremendous senior class my second year in 2016 at Troy. Um, we had a tremendous offseason. Those are to be determined here. Speaking of those receivers, mm -hmm. your oldest one, George Campbell, could apply for a sixth year? Have you so, looked at that? Yeah, so he, he's, he's applied, and we've, we've pretty certain that he'll be approved. Now, it's really going to be a decision for him. And almost like a junior, kind of like a normal junior, will he come out, will he won't come out. Um, and so I'm supportive of George. Here's the thing, when, when we got him from George, uh, or from, when we got George from Florida State, um, you know, we thought it was going to be a one year deal. Um, he exceeded expectations for the type of guy he's been. Y'all heard me say this. I mean, I think he ended up second on the whole football team in community service hours. Um, he gave some stability in that receiver room. And then he was our best special teams player, started all four Corey special teams units. And then, oh, by the way, he got significantly, whoever phone is, I'm going to decline this so you can read one. <laughs> all right. Um, but we got significantly, all right, we got some significant production from him <coughs> later in the year. Now, if he comes back, I think he could really mold into a high-level receiver. I think he's just not scratching the surface. But I'm completely supportive of him in whatever, whatever decision he makes. You mentioned specials, Neil. Uh, <laughs> hunting, you know, is that something you're going to have to address in recruiting? Do you have on so right now? We, we, we won't in the spring. We won't, we won't in the spring. We got, we got some guys here that need to get, they deserve to get looks. Uh, Colt McGee um, is one. Evan Mathis is, is another left footer, um, similar to, uh, to Josh. American similar. <laughs> and he, he doesn't have the Australian background. But, um, but we're going to go through the spring without making um, – any additions, and we'll kind of we'll see where we're at after spring. So I think it's too early to be determined, but I think both of those guys have shown some signs during the fall that that maybe they could they could be the guys. Neil, um, you talked about a few times during the season, kind of going back and watching early tape and mm -hmm. progressing and seeing how much better you are. Have you had a chance to do that, or even think about just with Jarrett running the offense and how did yeah. it look different? Did it look better? So. Really, all I've done over the last week is I've watched the TCU game kind of in depth, um, but I haven't. So, unfortunately, I'm going to have some time over the holidays now. And so, really, quarterback-wise, I'm sure I'll get this question, so I'll just answer it kind of um, together with this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and really evaluate Austin, Jarrett, and how they did and try to try to take the emotion away from from each individual game and just kind of look, see how they – how they manage the offense, how productive they were, um, decision making, those type of things, and then really come into January when our guys get back with kind of a clear plan of what what, what we're gonna what direction we're going, quarterback wise from a competition standpoint. You know, throughout the season, and not every week, but a couple of times, spotted at some high school games on Friday. Just curious if you're going up to Wheeling for Super so, Six this weekend. Yeah, I would like to. So the way it works is. Um, is you get one contact period. And so if you go to a game you don't have during contact period, it counts as my one visit. So if you go to the game, you can't go to the uh, to the home, okay? So you gotta kind of be careful on how you use that. So I'm not going, I would like to go, but 
we got official visitors this weekend. Um, and then there's one school's playing that, that I need to do a home visit. So, um, so I won't be making it. That's not the other. I would like to. So um, there's a process you go back that you go through that gives them really good feedback, and um, we're in the process of getting that returned. And so um, I'm supportive of the guys. I think it's fair for them to see kind of how they're viewed. You know, we're supportive of that, we, and we've been in contact. I'm going to talk to him again today. How's your reception been? You know, on the return <laughs> trail, and anything really surprised you that maybe you thought would be coming in? And well, so I think it's a little bit unique, even at some of the other uh, Power Five institutions I've been at, because, and I think I've talked about this before, is, you know, we we held some spot. We didn't get as high a number of commits um, going into the season, be, and, and we did that intentionally because I wanted to find out what some of our needs would be. And I don't think you really know until you play your league schedule, all right, or get into your league schedule. Whatever what I should say. Um, so now we've got some spots and we're in a position where we can finish really strong and, and that's, the, that's the intention. Uh, the reception's been positive. You know, I think the reception's been positive. Um, you know, our, I think the people that we've been on recruit um, is, when I'm talking in the class of 20, had solid improvement. They also see the fact that we've played a lot of young people. Uh, so that gives them hope that and they understand that we're going to play the best players, regardless of, of, of age. I think that gives some hope. And then um, we've been really active with the 21-22 class as far as getting them here this summer, getting them to games. Um, we had a couple great game day atmospheres that's benefited as well. And so I think our, our, our turnout from a level of player in December and January, now when we're allowed to have these junior days, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really uh, Well, it's definitely changed. Um, you know, I think that it, it is what it is. You know, it, it's, I think there's some really, like, and I think this is a social media in general. I think there's some extremely positive things about it. I think there's some extremely negative things about it. And there's probably, and that, that goes for recruiting as well. Um, but you have to use it. I mean, you have to use it. Um, I stay off of it. Um, as far as posting during during um, the season, and I try to, um, I'm really not on it a great deal during the season, just because it takes time. I think you have to be on it during recruiting. I think you need to use it to uh, promote the brand, promote the university, all those type of things. Um, but I think what it it gives people exposure. Um, we know more about guys because of social media, whether it's um, Twitter, Instagram. I stay away from Snapchat. That's kind of their that's kind of their domain. You know what I mean? Like I, I stay away from that. But um, I haven't got to the TikTok. I guess I need to kind of educate myself on that. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, hurts a little bit on his birthday. You can get on TikTok. Uh, but, uh, but I think I, here's what I think it's there's there's huge benefits of it. There's some negative aspects of it. But uh, from an educator, like we we have more information on the student athletes because of it. Uh, the video access is changed dramatically, you know, because basically like a 22 kid can post his highlights on social media and myself or our assistant coach or one of our recruiting people can see it. And that normally would be the case unless you were in high school and you ask the high school coach, hey, tell me about your younger guys. And they say, well, here, I've got a 22 prospect and then you go back and you get on hold. Now, there it is out there and you can see it. You know, no different than some of these guys who are making a living in recruiting in here. You know, when it comes to the chatter among the coaches or we're talking with some of the players about maybe coming out early or just going yeah. pro in general, does that conversation change much with some of these alternative leagues to the NFL starting to pop up like the XFL? I think it's too early to, to tell. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think it will. I think that what it does, it gives some guys um, 
that maybe a college career has ended prematurely for whatever reason, give them some avenues to pursue. But I don't, I don't think you'll, unless somebody's in a real financial bind or something like that, maybe I could see the thought process of leaving. Um, I haven't had any of those discussions with guys yet. Um, no, like my one rule as a head coach is I'm never surprised. So like I wouldn't be like I wouldn't be surprised if we hadn't had some of those. But I don't I don't foresee it being an issue right now. Was there a lesson to take from the season for you? Nah, you know I, I think there's all kinds of lessons. Really, I think the one um, I think the leagues changed. Um, Gary Patterson and I were talking about it before the game. I think the leagues changed. Uh, I knew that going in, but going through it. I think there's a lot of parity in the league. I think that if you look across the board, um, you know, the argument could be made, excuse me, that we had an opportunity to win. Now, the games we won, we had an opportunity to lose, too. I mean, I'm not blind. But we were in every game with the exception of one in the, in the fourth quarter in the Big 12. Um, I think the, the level of coaching in all three phases is, is really – I think there's improvements, especially defensively, special teams from when I was in the league before. Um, I think that where you play everybody, and you play nine in a row, it, that's that's a grind, you know. And I, I'm not sure that that any of the other leagues, and I'm not trying to demean any of the other leagues. I'm just saying that's unique to our league. You play nine in a row, you play everybody, um, and it's a it, it's, it's a it's a difficult road. You know, your staff had um, kind of a weird split. Guys. Yeah, five months. Guys that coached with me before? Yeah, yeah right. They came with you and then you um, – and that's something I guess you never really were asked about or talked about, but kind of blending that in. It's almost like a new team and an old team doing it with the coaches. Yeah. How did that management go? So, I'll just kind of talk about it on both sides of the ball because I think that's kind of how it okay. – um, so, if you look at it defensively, you had um, Vic and Pogue and, and Jordan, who had obviously spent the previous three years together. Jordan, Jordan joined us in year two of Troy. Um, and so, and then Blake and Vic had a relationship, and then Jamal coming back, who has the ties to West Virginia, um, and I thought they did a really good job. I, mean, I thought that Vic and Jamal were uh, well together in the secondary. I thought Jamal brought some some new and unique perspective and ideas into that defensive room, um, and I thought he that continued to progress as we went through the year. Our pass our pass coverage got better. And he was a big piece of that as we moved through the year. Um, offensively, um, Xavier and Trickett were the guys that we haven't, that hadn't worked with the, the kind of the core group. Um, Chad and I have been together for a while. Chad had worked with, with Sean and with Matt at different times. He just hadn't been in Troy during the second run we had. Um, so Trickett kind of knew what we did because he'd been in the Sun Belt. Um, and then Xavier, um, from a philosophy standpoint of what he was doing at Clemson and how we kind of ran our program and what we were doing offensively. I think there was a lot of crossover. Um, some of the receiver techniques and things like that um, because how the, how the game's officiated, how the game's played in the Big 12 were a little different for him. I thought we did a, I thought we did a pretty decent job adjusting um, on some of our fundamentals and techniques as we went through the year. Um, but I'm pleased. I thought, I thought the guys, um, it's not a selfish group group that has um, the better of the whole in mind. And so, um, you know, anytime you're putting a group together, there's always going to be some growth. You know, I think it'll be smoother in year two than it was in year one. I think that's the case any time. But I'm pleased with those guys overall. Right. A lot's going to change in the next 30 days across the country. What is the intent to keep this group together? Yeah, that's the intent. You, you never know. It's like, it's, um, but that's the intent. You know, I think that's, that's the intent. Um, you know, there's, how many open jobs now? And, you know, there's there's going to be movement over the next two months, but that's that's the intent. Um, I tell our staff is is I'm for them personally, um, but the my greater responsibilities to to the university and to our to our football program. And so my hope here is it's a working environment they want to be part of. They see they see where we're going, how we're and they appreciate how we're going how we're going about getting there. And we're giving them an opportunity to grow in the profession. And that's what I want to make sure is that we're continuing to develop them as coaches to whatever their end goal is, whether it's coordinator, head coach, whatever it is. And that's everybody within the whole organization we're, de we're developing. I think that's that's part of the job of the head coach. Okay, thanks.
Thanks, Coach. Okay. Thank you all. See you all next